thank you very much. I have to live up to, to my introduction now. Um, so I suppose today um, where I'm coming from and what I was thinking of is um, how as lawyers, I'm a lawyer and I'm worried I suppose like everybody else about how the act will uh, work out in practice. I am approaching it as a lawyer and I apologize to those of you in the audience um, for that who are not lawyers and forgive me but um, I, I'm, I'm approaching it on the basis of you know what are the legal structural changes that we're going to see and, and how might that impact on practice I'm going to keep it quite net um, there are there have been great speakers here this morning who've talked about some of the principles behind the legislation and about the concerns that the legislation doesn't address. Uh, for example, the big one being, I suppose, for me, deprivation of liberty safeguards. Um, so, but I'm going to keep it quite net. Um, so, uh, and I suppose I might start with. <laughs> I don't know if this is a message to myself or <laughs> to everybody else. Um, don't panic. There is a very clear legal structure in the Act and it sets out and it signals the clear legal changes that are going to come into uh, effect when the Act comes in. In terms of that, um, my understanding is that the, we won't be waiting for the codes of practice to be, uh, to be drawn up fully before we go to implementation. Um, that as soon as the office of the uh, director is set up that the Department of Justice considers it could potentially roll out at that stage. We do have our specialist judges, um, so it may may well, I mean obviously if we get a government, it may well um, you know, come into operation is, uh, by the end of the year. Now I know uh, from our dealings with the Mental Health Act that we may feel negative about the timelines, but you never know. So these uh, are the key changes um, in law that we can expect as practitioners. I've um, identified eight sort of key changes uh, from our current legal framework into uh, as, as what will come out from the uh, Capacity Act. So uh, you've heard already the ward of court system to be abolished a review will happen of all wards. We're going to have a new legal process to deal with decision making for a relevant person in respect of a relevant decision. Um, and I know that could lead to a plethora of uh, decisions, plethora of, of court applications, but I'm not sure, you know, we'll see how that works in practice. But uh, we're going to have a new court process rather to replace, I suppose, the ward of court system. Um, we're going to have the new role in office of the Director of Decision Support Service and there will be new panels to be established by the Director. Um, we're going to have new provisions for enduring powers of attorney um, and for the first time we will have statutory effect to advance healthcare directives. Um, there will be, and I want to talk a little bit about the interaction with the Mental Health Act um, and I'm going to talk about the detention provisions and these apply to wards only, okay? The existing wards only. That's what the detention provisions apply to. So um, this has been gone through a little bit, so I won't go into it too much, but just as things that we as solicitors, we deal with the general solicitor a lot when we're dealing with wards. Um, so that, that role will be gone. The general solicitor acts as a committee for a person who is committed to wardship who doesn't have anybody else to act for them or where there's a, a, you know, a dispute between family members as to who should be the committee. So that's the general solicitor. So there won't be a general solicitor. There won't be a committee. Instead, there will be a decision-making representative. Um, the monies. <laughs> where is the money going to go? Um, so currently, quite considerable sums are held by the accountant of the Courts of Justice. They will be released to all the former wards following review, and all wards have to be reviewed within three years of the coming into force of the legislation. Obviously, the role of the President of the High Court under the 1871 Act will also cease, and I'm personally quite disappointed about that because 
right now we have a president of the high court who is very interested in these cases um and has is actually trying to operate the war current wardship um legislation in a manner that's compliant with the convention in particularly in relation to deprivation of liberty so he's actually conducting reviews every three months uh, of wards who are in detention now i know there's some debate as to what wards are in detention and i think there's a figure as uh, has been mentioned of six wards that are in detention but i think that may be in approved centers there's probably and potentially quite a few more. I think Dr. Corker mentioned that you know there are other wards who are in effective deprivation uh, of liberty. Um, so then the the new applications will largely be dealt with by the specialist courts judges. So um, this is the mechanism for review, and in this section, the court for review is the wardship court. It will not be the circuit court who does the review, it is the wardship court that is currently generally the high court and sometimes uh, the circuit court. Uh, so it's the court that has jurisdiction of the current wards that, that will carry out the review. And these are the persons who can make the um, application. And if the person themselves or somebody at the, doesn't make the application or someone on their behalf, then there will be an automatic review of all the wards within three years. Now, as I understand it, the Ward of Court Office is well up, uh, you know, is well geared towards getting all of that done within the relevant time frames. Um, so, what happens then uh, when the person has been reviewed? This is what the Wardship Court can declare that the person does not lack capacity um, and make what are the, uh, these declarations that they lack capacity unless with the assistance of a suitable person as a co-decision maker is made available to him or her to make more than one one or more decisions sorry um, or uh, that the ward lacks capacity even if the assistance of a suitable person as a co-decision maker were made available to him or her so where there is capacity, the Wardship Court makes a declaration pursuant to Section 551A, it shall immediately discharge the ward from Wardship and shall order the property to be returned to the former ward and give him or her such direction as it thinks appropriate, having regard both to the, to the discharge and the circumstances of the former ward. Where they require a co-decision maker, again, a co-decision making agreement has to be entered into. The, ward is discharged and then all the property shall be returned to him or her again with directions and having regard to their circumstances and then where no capacity um, and that's 551 b2 then it will be necessary for a decision making representative to be appointed and as i mentioned earlier that's a similar role to the current committees um, the Wardship Court can make such orders as it uh, considers appropriate and it can order that the property of the former ward be returned to him or her upon the appointment of a decision-making representative. But again, obviously, if that person doesn't have capacity, then it's the decision-making representative that would have control over uh, the funds in that particular case. So currently, our funds are, the funds of a ward um, are in court um, and there is certain oversight but in this scenario uh, where will the funds go um, so and again pending the making of de declarations the jurisdiction for all persons who are wards will be with the wardship court so you I don't think you will be finding yourself before the circuit court so the spe specialist judges in respect of any person who is a ward um, so then this is the new legal um, process to deal with decision making for relevant persons now this has been gone through I think a few times this morning so I'm not sure that um, I need to go through this in too much detail with you um, but I suppose we have a new system of dealing with assisting a person in realizing their capacity and that's really what this act is all about and a new system and process to deal with decision making in respect of for a relevant person who is a person whose capacity may be coming an issue um, to assist them in exercising their decision making capacity. Um, 
and in terms of the assessment there, section three um for the purposes of this act, a person's capacity shall be assessed on the basis of his or her ability to understand at the time the decision is to be made, the nature and consequences of this of the decision to be made by him or her in the context of the available choices at that time. Um, and clearly a person is entitled to exercise his or her legal capacity even if he or she may have difficulty making decisions. And I think that is being recognized um, and I think we don't really need to, I don't think I need to say it to this audience. Um, so the relevant person is the person whose capacity is in question or um, may shortly be in question and um, the person who lacks capacity in respect of one or more than one matter. So it is somebody who hasn't got capacity or who may not have capacity shortly. These are the uh, relevant decisions that come within the um, legislation. I'm not going to go through them, they're on the slide. Uh, but again, you know, really does, it could come down to any kind of decision. Um, and where they, where a person considers their capacity may be in question or may shortly be in question, they may uh, appoint a decision making assistant, okay? And that's a personal appointment by the person themselves. Now I know, I, I feel bad almost being so basic, but you know, the, just bear with me. So um, you have your assi assisted decision making assistant, then you have your co-decision maker. This is a joint decision process where a person, they can appoint a person to make joint decisions with them. And for this particular scenario, for co-decision making, um, there are certain formalities to be observed and they must be registered to be in force. And that application is to the, uh, the director and the register will be maintained by the director. So for the first one, there is an assisted decision-making agreement and there will be regulations drafted, but um, it, isn't a f it doesn't have to be registered. And then the final um, assistant is the decision-making representative. And again, that is on court appointment. Um, and that is following a declaration that the person does not have capacity. And this is the section here. I'm going to be repeating this um, in a later slide, so I'll just move on. Um, and in terms of the court process, the court means, and this has been mentioned already, the court means the circuit court, except for certain matters reserved to the high court. And Dr. Corkery mentioned those matters that are reserved to the high court, and they're set out here on the slide, um, where an advanced healthcare directive may concern the life of the unborn and again there are certain decisions in relation to uh, withdrawal of life sustaining treatment from a person who lacks capacity um, or organ donation from a living donor who is a person who hasn't got capacity those have to go before the high court but other than that the, the, it is to the circuit court and this is the application process to the circuit court, it's set out in section 36. Um, and these are the persons who can make the application to the circuit court. Now, in terms of this part of the act, there is legal aid available under section 52. Now, I've read section 52 and I can't figure it out properly. Um, it's quite complicated. But, and you have to read lots of other pieces of legislation to work it out. But as far as, but what I've been told, uh, so as I couldn't work it out myself, I've been told that it would not be means tested. That is my understanding, that there's legal aid for these applications and they would not be means tested. And as I understand it, and this is obviously of interest to the lawyers as well, that, that um, it will be a system which is run by the legal aid board so therefore, if you are already on the legal aid board um, and you have a person who uh, has come to you uh, in relation to an application like this, then um, that person would be entitled to be represented by you under the legal aid scheme. That is my understanding of the, of the process. So, um, so the, there has to be... Uh, if it's by way, uh, there's consent, sorry, by uh, an ex parte application. I don't want to go through this in too much detail because I might run out of time. Um, but the consent of the court is required. And this is the declaration that can be made 
under section 37 um, that the relevant person, the subject of the application, lacks capacity unless the assistance of a suitable co-decision maker is made available to him or her. Um, and then a declaration under B that um, they could, sorry, a co-decision maker, sorry, I'm going to go on to the next one. Declaration that the relevant person, the subject of the application, lacks capacity even with the uh, assistance of a suitable person as a co-decision maker were made available to him or her to make one or more decisions specified in the declaration relating to his or her personal welfare or property or affairs or both. So these are the kind of orders that the court can make. Um, and I should say that the proceedings, according to the legislation, are to be held otherwise than in public. So um, it is not my understanding that they will be held in open court. Uh, I hope I have that correct, but that's certainly uh, in section that is set out in the legislation. It's section 3610. Um, the, it's in sec section 3610 is quite interesting. It says that the hearings have to be held with the least amount of formalities and to be heard otherwise than in public and um, judges and the legal practitioners will not be wearing gowns and wigs. So that's also actually set out in the legislation as well. So um, in terms of the orders, um, the court can appoint a decision-making representative for the purposes of one or more decisions. So they make a decision-making representative order and it can make a, um, a decision-making order. So. In some circumstances, the court itself will make the orders for the person concerned, but in other circumstances, they, if it's urgent or expedient, but in other circumstances, they will <coughs> appoint a representative, and that's the decision-making representative order. And in terms of the principles that apply, again, they've been set out, and Mary Donnelly spent um, a good deal of time on this, um, but also I just thought it was interesting that preserving the relationships is actually set out in the legislation and that the court will take into account the compatibility of the person and the decision-making representatives. And if there isn't a suitable person willing to act as a decision-making representative, the court then can request the director to nominate two or more persons from the panel. So there is a panel, a decision-making representative panel, which is going to be held, set up by the director. And I'll go on to those shortly. Um, this is the appointment of the director of the decision support service. Now I know that uh, there's been a bit of hoo-ha because it hasn't the the position hasn't even yet been um, I suppose advertised. Um, I think the difficulty in that is that uh, we haven't got government, <laughs> and I think that's required to 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 uh, brand <laughs> that. So um, yes, everything uh, revolves around having no government, but um, the it's actually. What they decided the last minute in the uh, Dáil debates in relation to who would, where would the um, director of decision support services sit? Would they be within the kind of former court service or would they be somewhere else? And it was decided last minute that in fact, um, which I'm not sure if it was a, a surprise to the mental health commission or not, I'm saying nothing on that, but uh, it was decided that it would sit within the mental health commission and the mental health commission will appoint the person to be known as the director of the decision-making support services. Now I will say for those of us who are dealing with the mental health commission in terms of the tribunals and the reviews that they are very efficient in terms of making sure that everything happens when it should, when it should happen. Within, within the time frames of the legislation. So, I mean, it is, it is certainly, they're well equipped to deal with uh, the administrative side of things. Um, so they have to have the appropriate expertise, qualifications, etc. I'm not sure if I've got a time limit there. These are the functions um, of the director. Um, I won't go through them all, but they have um, obviously a, a serious number of functions. The one that is probably um, of interest to us as lawyers as well is the last one to supervise compliance by decision-making um, assistants, co-decision makers, decision-making representatives and attorneys in the performance of their functions under the Act. And there is a role there for visitors in relation to that and I'll come back to that later. And these are the rest of the functions, information, guidelines, recommendations for change, practices, etc. Um, and these are the powers 
powers of investigation, section ninety six um and the director can appoint a person to be a court friend for the relevant person um and that's in respect of applications uh to the circuit court uh, for a decision making representative a person may require a court friend where there is nobody else to act for them and we don't have any guidance as to what a court friend would be at this stage um and the director can establish panels and these are the codes of practice. Um, they're, they're not going to, as, as I said, I, I don't think they're going to hold the uh, act, coming into force of the act back. I think the act will go ahead even if the co codes of practice are not ready. And I know that it's the National Disability Authority that might be dealing with the codes of practice um, on behalf of the Department of Justice. So these are the panels. Um, that the director establishes. You've got your decision-making representatives for relevant persons, and that is where there is no committee. So I suppose, in a sense, maybe that's like our general solicitor at the moment. I don't know, but it doesn't have to be somebody with. It doesn't have to be somebody with legal expertise. Where at the moment, if you haven't got a committee, a family member committee. And there is, or there is a dispute between family members. It is the general solicitor who fulfills that role. And so for decision-making representatives, I don't know exactly what, you know, what the suitable qualifications for that role might be and who, who the panel members would be. But they will be pe persons who are unconnected with the person, the subject of the, uh, you know, of the uh, order. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, we'll have special visitors. There'll be a panel of special uh, visitors, medical practitioners, and those with expertise in capacity, general visitors. And this is where the powers of the director in terms of enforcement and supervision comes in. There will be general visitors, those with expertise to assist the director in supervision of decision-making assistants, representatives, and co-decision makers, and attorneys to ensure compliance with their functions, and then court friends. Um, just, I don't have very much left to go through, but um, in terms of the changes, obviously we operate under enduring power of attorney currently, but the changes to this is that the powers of attorney act 1996 will remain, but with facilities for review by the director of the decision support services. One of the issues that, there, that has been raised, I suppose, in relation to our current regime is that there's no supervision. So now the supervision, there will be review of those powers of attorneys, or the enduring power of attorney documents, and the operation of them by the director. Um, once the 2015 Act comes into place, the creating of, the, of EPAs under the 1996 Act will cease, and then um, the, uh, this, this, I suppose, most significant change in terms of enduring power of attorneys in this Act is that they will now relate to healthcare decisions. So they did not previously relate to healthcare decisions. So this is the most significant change in terms of the enduring power of attorney. So they were re relatively limited. And that is why you'd see a lot of applications to court because somebody hasn't been in a position to make directions, I suppose, as to their um, healthcare provisions. So now you will be able to do that. Um, and then for advanced healthcare directives, um, again, first time we have statutory recognition for them. Um, and they relate in particular to a current wish to refuse certain treatment in the future when the person that person loses capacity. Um, a directive, it is in relation to a refusal that they will be binding. If you make an advanced healthcare directive requesting specific treatment, uh, so certainly I would request that my specific treatment will take place in a four-star hotel in, uh, <laughs> you know, in Abu Dhabi or somewhere, a five-star. Um, you obviously can't have, you know, that's difficult uh, for it to be le legally binding, but it can, can be taken into account. There are certain formalities to be in writing and to be signed to witnesses. The person appoints a designated healthcare representative. Uh, now, this is very troubling for those of us who operate the Mental Health Act. Advanced health care directives will not apply where a person becomes detained under the Mental Health Act and has been treated under Part 4. 
And in our uh, discussions as a review, review group, um, the expert steering group, when we reviewed the uh, 2001 Act, this did come up. Um, and I suppose our discussions were that um, an advanced healthcare directive that is made for a person who's suffering from a mental disorder should be as equally binding as any other healthcare directive for any other person, and therefore it should be binding under the Mental Health Act, except in very rare uh, extreme circumstances where there was a risk to life. Um, and, and that ultimately is, is more or less our recommendation. It's, it's quite, the report, it's quite difficult to kind of, we, we, because the Capacity Act wasn't yet in four, or the, sorry, those provisions of the advanced healthcare directives had not yet been uh, drafted <coughs> for the capacity legislation, we were at a bit of sea uh, and we didn't know quite what was uh, going to happen. So anyway, it's, it's, it's quite difficult, but um, I'm hoping that when the 2001 Act uh, is finally reviewed and, and the cha legislative changes are made, that respect will be given to the overwhelming voice of my clients um, that they should have choice in their treatment uh, or certainly be able to have to refuse certain treatments in particular ECT is a big worry for some clients where they have valid in other jurisdictions they have valid advanced healthcare directive about a, um, not wishing to be treated with ECT but if they are detained under our legislation even with the capacity um, legislation in force in Ireland, that will not be respected. They can be treated without without their consent and I suppose in the face of a valid, in any other jurisdiction, a valid advanced healthcare directive in relation to a refusal for ECT. That leaves uh, you know people in a very vulnerable position and not wanting to, to be compulsorily detained and to avoid at all costs being uh, compulsorily detained and to avoid engagement sometimes with services because of that. So that's something that really has to be revisited. Oh, and just I just put this slide up here because just to, to show, I suppose, that this is, that it is an exception. It was considered, um, and you know, Minister Lynch was saying there it will be dealt with in the new mental health bill, and I just I couldn't resist putting this in. I know Professor Kelly is probably going to kill me about this, but when I consulted Professor Brenton Kelly, whom I trust very much on this matter, uh, he agreed that advanced healthcare directives under the Mental Health Act must be legally binding, but in the event of an imminent serious harm or the possibility of, su of such, the consultant would have to overrule that advanced healthcare directive. However, he or she would have to explain the decision before the court, so in exceptional circumstances only. Um, we have a lot of issues. Um, in relation to the position of a voluntary patient under our um, Mental Health Act um, because we have a considerable number of, uh, there are a considerable num number of people who are considered to be voluntary patients but who do not have capacity and that situation has arisen because of the decision I suppose in EH out the 2009 decision um, and the court in that particular judgment said the terminology adopted in section 2 of the 2001 Act ascribes a very particular meaning to the term voluntary patient. It does not describe such a person as one who freely and voluntarily gives consent to an admission order. So there is no idea of voluntariness, if you like, capacity. The, the court has ignored the issues of capacity or consent in coming to that uh, definition or, or accepting that that's a definition. Instead, the express statutory language defines a voluntary <coughs> person as a pe person receiving care and treatment in an approved centre who is not the subject of an admission order or a renewal order. So if you're in hospital uh, as, a, as a patient in an approved centre, and you don't want to be there, or you haven't got capacity to consent to being there, you are a voluntary patient as a matter of law, unless there is an order saying that you're, thank you very much, saying that you're a, a, a detaining you, an involuntary patient. So that is simply the situation. I've certainly acted for people who were not willing, who were fully detained, couldn't even go to, to a coffee shop, were all in their pajamas for two or three months, uh, who, who were termed and deemed to be 
voluntary patients. So it's something that we are hoping, I suppose, as lawyers, that now that the uh, capacity legislation, uh, certainly once it comes into force, that we may be able to see that decisions around treatment in particular will be looked at in light of the capacity legislation and, uh, and, and taking into account a person's capacity um, rather than a absolutely ignoring it for the purposes of, of being a voluntary patient, which is what's, happened, what's happening at the moment. We have to um, get into the ideas of consent and there's no idea of consent in our current, current situation. There is no consent. Um, so these are the detention provisions um, and this is only in relation to being detained under the Mental Health Act if, um, so it doesn't, again, it doesn't deal with deprivation of liberty safeguards. So if an, an any application to the circuit court or high court um, in relation to matters under the capacity legislation, it appears that somebody is suffering from a mental disorder, then they will be, de uh, they will be dealt with under the Mental Health Act and under the review mechanisms of the Mental Health Act. So that is a good thing because previously wards were not, they were excluded from the provisions of the Mental Health Act and any ward who is in a detained, uh, sorry, who's detained in an approved centre currently does not have any right of review uh, by a tribunal. They don't have a right to a lawyer, they don't have a right to independent psychiatric assessment. Wards are completely excluded and the only reason that they're getting some rights at the moment is because the President has said the President of the High Court has said that they should have lawyers uh, representing them and they should have review and that High Court is doing the review. Um, and then these are the detained uh, wards, as I said, they don't come under the provisions but they will be, uh, they will be reviewed um, and the detention will continue to be reviewed by the Wardship Court. Um, and I'm just, it also actually deals with the review of wards in non-approved centres. So this will be, I think, the first time that we have a kind of, maybe the Bournemouth gap is coming in the back door. Um, we will, because we, we don't consider detention to be detention unless it's detention in this country, unless it's, by, as a matter of law, unless it's detention in an approved centre under the Mental Health Act. So in this particular section, we are now talking about detention outside of an approved centre in social care homes. So we have a recognition of de facto detention outside of the 2001 Act. And that actually I think is quite significant and I think it, it, it will be interesting to see how that works out in practice. Oh, and finally. <laughs> Once again, don't panic. Thank you very much.